Well, now we are coming to the question and answer session. Just a reminder, we are talking about COVID-19. Uh, our first speaker talked about the uh, test kits and our second speaker talked about the vaccination area. So, uh, well, there are already some questions being posed uh, in the question and answer section. Uh, I would like perhaps to uh, ask a question and pose the first question to Dr. Lo. Uh, there's a question that's being posed in the question and answer section and say is that, it says that uh, um, what's the, the, the regards to the study of the positive correlation between the CT value and the transmissibility? Is there uh, how correlated are they? How correlated is there a co correlation coefficient? No. Um, so this is like this. Um, <clears throat> there is a. Uh, I did leave something out because of the interest of time. I couldn't re really tell you. The CT value itself, um, at 25, for example, you take 25 CT value on a day one, and a 25 CT value on a day eight, they mean vastly different things. Because if you take 25, a CT value of 25 on day one, a person was day one, by day two, the CT value drops to 15. Roughly, roughly, it drops. A CT value of 25 that's going to drop tomorrow is vastly different of a CT value of 25 that's going to be the same the next day. If you have CD value 28, so essentially we are saying the CD value 25 represents a small number of live active transmissible virus, but the CD value 25 later in infection represents an even smaller number of infectious virus and a whole lot of dead ones. And hence the transmissibility at the same 25 is vastly different. So which is why if you look at some of our guidelines, it's not only CT based uh, early on until the recent revision. It's not only CT based, it's also time based. So um, various studies have generally demonstrated with the closeness of contact is sufficiently close, a low CT is more highly transmissible. However, the, the difficulty to generalize this is it's hard to make it into a generalized case because earlier, before COVID, we never had CT value to look at transmissibility of measles, chicken pox. So, so this is still a early area of science. Yes. Okay, thank I'll you. Answer that. Thank you, Justin, for an answering quite a difficult question. Now, maybe I'll give you a break and uh, or ask the next question and jump to Dr. Danny soon. Uh, that's an interesting question, but uh, I think, okay. Uh, what is the difference, if any, in hospital, hospitalization in severe illness rates of those who, who had a primary cause of COVID vaccination okay, and versus those who received the booster? I mean, just the primary cause versus the booster. Is there any difference in terms of their uh, degree of uh, severe uh, illness presentation? Um, what's, the, what's the advantage of having a booster? In the booster, if you look at uh, some data that was presented by Israel, but this is in, a, uh, no, sorry, by the UK, uh, in a smaller, uh, uh, I think, age-restricted group. Um, the booster... The, the primary cause of vaccination actually uh, decreases because of waning immunity. Uh, that actually, uh, over a period of time, we know that now boosters are necessary because immunity does wane. And with a booster, you do actually restore the uh, uh, protection against uh, infection as well as against hospitalization. And further, with the Omicron, that's also shown to be, in fact, important. Because with the Omicron, there's greater evasion of the uh, immune system. Uh, boosting of the uh, uh, boosting of uh, with the, with the, with even the current uh, vaccines which are, have been uh, built up against the prior strains of uh, uh, COVID is that this restores it back to where it was prior to uh, the uh, uh, at the point of you know so basically where you had a, a, a early on after your primary vaccination. So I don't have the exact uh, numbers for you at this point, but the, it is a restoration of that delta, and it's also time dependent, right? Because it depends on at which point you're talking about uh, you're taking hospitalization rates mm. from the primary versus what it is versus the current point of a, a booster, mm. right? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Danny. Mm -hmm. Well, since, since we're on this topic about this booster, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we heard, I want to pose a question that is uh, to immigrate the two speakers' uh, content. Okay? Uh, so, s there are still people who are concerned about having repeated boosters you know, and wearing whether repeated boosters will have some uh, adverse effects on, on this vaccination uh, schedule. So, is there a role in testing the serology as a guide to decide whether a booster is necessary for an individual. What do the two speakers think? So, uh, so actually, um, 
You know, we've always called the two-dose primary and the third-dose booster. That's because we just learned about mRNA vaccine. If you look at some of the vaccine earlier on, like, say, um, HPV vaccine, well, it's a three-dose primary. If you look at hepatitis B vaccine, well, it's a three-dose primary. Now, if you take two doses of hepatitis B vaccine, do you have protection? Yes, you will have some protection. Some young children can get some protection on two doses. But after three doses, uh, for, I'll take Hep B vaccine, for example, a very peculiar effect happens. If you take three doses of uh, hepatitis B vaccine, and even if your antibody level were to wane 10 years after the third dose, you are largely considered protected. As long as you have had a spike of antibody after the third dose, that's the general consensus. So people are actually, there's a, there's a body of opinion trying to say that the third dose booster is not a booster. It's a primary. It is actually primary one, two, three. And after the third primary, then that booster, whether you really need or not, it could be in the distant future. We, we don't know. And, and that is also um, to do with how fast the variant is changing, how far lead, how, how different the new variant is going to be. So, so I think the serology question is an interesting one. I think over time, maybe we'll get to a sharper definition of what uh, a cutoff could be. Uh, at this point, you know, on a population basis, there's some correlation between the antibody level as well as protection, okay, on a population basis. And I think as uh, Dr. Lowe had mentioned in an earlier uh, presentation is that, uh, however, on an individual basis, it's, yet, it's hard to use that as, as a exactly. pr prospective uh, yes. marker, yes. right, as to whether someone should be uh, vaccinated yes. uh, with a booster or not. So that's something that at this point, uh, the agencies uh, tend not to want to uh, use that as a, as, a, as a kind of a cutoff. Uh, but, you know, over time, let's see how it goes. And I think the other point around uh, uh, the, the variance also matters. So this is an evolving area where uh, when you look at the uh, so-called serology, you know, there, there's some variability that goes into it. And then when you have variance and they talk about whether there's a marker for protection against the variance, this whole thing is very, gets very murky. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the combined answer to this very difficult question. Uh, we, we sincerely hope that the third boost, I mean, the third dose booster will be the end of the thing. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, there's one question coming from the audience. Uh, yeah. It's about the test kits again. Okay. okay. So now uh, we know that the uh, currently we are using the uh, isopharyngeal swab for the PCR and the uh, and the uh, anterior nasal swap for the ART. Um, now, um, there's a question that posed... Okay, so both, both, both techniques are uncomfortable, especially for the children, the young kids. Yeah. So, is, what is, is there any recent advances in terms of uh, saliva test kit, uh, breath analyzers, you know, which are probably would be more comfortable for the children? Well, uh, well, if we talk about saliva, actually, saliva, although it's definitely more comfortable, it's just spitting. But uh, you actually have to produce a sufficient quantity. And you actually, there's actually a certain step, you know, you can't be drinking milk, eating broccoli before that, you can't be... So the, the mouth has to be really cleansed. And, and that, that itself is a challenge for very young children, right? They're always munching something. So, so then the other thing, uh, when it comes to volatile organic uh, acids test, um, that one is, is a bit difficult because uh, it, it's... First of all, it has to be standardized across various locations and it's not exactly that specific. And if they are, I suppose if you have a smoker or something, it can interfere with some of this. So it's a bit difficult to roll that out on a big scale. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, again, another question in regards to the ART mm -hmm. and the... Okay, so um, a question is being posed. Uh, ART has reduced sensitivity for Omicron compared to the Delta variant. Slightly, yes. Okay. Any comments on the emphasis on ART screening rather than PCR for symptomatic individuals? So, in other words, uh, should we differentiate between asymptomatic and symptomatic? Symptomatic, perhaps, can use the ART. Asymptomatic, perhaps, PCR or so, vice versa. So, so that, that, that is a very good point. Um, so, there's probably a regulatory mm -hmm. angle to that. But from what I understand, uh, is this. Yes, ART does have a lower sensitivity for asymptomatic cases and it is slightly about 10% shy of, of Delta when it comes to ART sensitivity. However, um, we must also understand testing and case detection is not our only defense. It's not our only defense, right? We have isolation, we have vaccine, which already shortens the period, and we have Omicron, which is slightly shorter incubation period, slightly shorter transmission period. And now, 
Early on, remember our, our uh, isolation window was 14 days, 21 days, right? And now we actually realise most of the infection was spread between minus one to three or four. And beyond that, yep, it's pretty uh, not, not that transmissible. So um, it probably... It's probably a balance between testing resources, isolation resources, and in a nutshell, we're probably saying we don't have to find every single one of them and scour the ends of the country to find every single one if all the rest of the setup, the defences are up. So it is a layered defence. We will miss some at each level, but all the layers together will bring us through. Hmm, fantastic answer. I think basically that's it. Uh, there's a certain... Um you know, there's a certain penetration at each level. Even PCR, for yes. example, you don't pick everything up. Uh, but, you know, it is coupled, for example, you talk about the... Uh, let's use the example of travel lanes, right? Where people come... Before they board the plane, they do an ART. And then they jump on the plane, they come back, they do a PCR on entry, and they've got seven days. And there's some limitations on your movement before you get a, a negative test. So those are sort of layered defences which allow us time. Let's say if you're symptomatic for that to, if, to, to come, come forward, uh, the testing, uh, seven days, if you're multiplying the uh, low sensitivity across seven tests, you will likely still be able to pick something up, right? So that's basically the layering that uh, gives us some hope to get into the state of endemicity, right? Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, on that topic, maybe uh, just continue to pose a question to Dr. Dennis Soon. Yes. Okay. Um, so what's the current status now for patients who have recovered from COVID infection? What is the current status with regards to uh, booster? And is there any recommendations in the near future as to, as to whether they still need booster or, or that's it? Right. So at this point, we, we, take, uh, uh, we look at uh, infection as if it was one very strong vaccination, right? So when combined with a vaccine or two vaccine doses, uh, we reckon that that gives you reasonably good protection. And at this point, uh, uh, there is, the, depending which part you are on the algorithm, there's generally no real uh, need for you to get a booster. Right? Mm. Uh, we shall see how this pans out mm. over time. Uh, it could be that uh, if we see more uh, cases of breakthrough and if they become they are serious because of this, uh, that, that may be recommended. There's still talk at this point about whether even a fourth dose is needed. Uh, we, we, we are not there yet, I would say. I think fundamentally, the, even the Israelis, they've moved forward with the fourth dose, but only for the vulnerable groups right now. And uh, it's all really a matter of, I guess, the sums of how how much exposure you get over a period of time and how, whether the, the, the immunity uh, remains against hospitalization particularly mm. and serious illnesses. At this point, uh, we don't have enough data to make that determination, but at this point, we don't, that, that's not necessary for boosting. Okay, that's yeah. great. That's good to hear. Mm -hmm. One last jab. Now, um, back to Dr. Lowe. Okay, uh, just one question from the uh, audience. Um, you mentioned about city values and we certainly learned a lot from you about the city values. So a high, high, uh, if CT values are high, does it follow that a patient will not infect another patient or for that matter, healthcare workers like us? So uh, uh, earlier on, uh, earlier in this outbreak, uh, the cutoff for CT was actually 30, right? That was the earlier in the, in the circulars. And, and that cutoff was because at a at, uh, cutoff of 30, uh, especially late into the infection uh, after seven or eight days, um, uh, many studies have found it difficult to culture the virus. There is no virus culturable. And if there's no virus that can be cultured, I mean, it follows that there is uh, no transmission possible. And uh, or studies have also shown that at very high CT, I mean, you saw the household study that I presented earlier, uh, the transmission rates are very low, in, even in groups of people who are living closely together. So, which is why, yeah, this is why 30 was a cutoff. And then uh, after that, when we learned more, we realized the cutoff can be even lower to 25. And uh, so that, that, there is some data that uh, on a population level. However, do not say that if you're, if you're asymptomatic and you have a CT of 30, then, uh, because now there are a lot of asymptomatic infection because people are vaccinated and boosted. If you're asymptomatic and you have a single cutoff of 30, you don't know whether you're day eight or you're day one. Mm. That's the danger. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Now back to Dr. Soon. Okay. Uh, you know, even in current day and age, we still have people who are concerned about uh, mRNA being a very new technology. Uh, there's still some uncertainty. No. Now, um, what is the development, or is there any more concrete data coming out from Sinovac, Sinopharm, the more traditional form of vaccination? Uh, is it is there more data supporting the use of this compared to? 
uh, just the mRNA because we know that in, even in Singapore, our government seems to be relaxing on the use of Sinovac and Sinopharm for vaccination. What's your comments? Uh, good question. I think, um, you know, I think it's understandable uh, why uh, uh, people at large would be uncomfortable with new technologies, right? Uh, I, but mRNA is not exactly new, new. It's been around for a, a large number of years. It's actually been in clinical trials uh, for uh, cancer indications. It's been in clinical trials for some infectious disease indications. So it's been in, it's been in use, it's been in humans uh, prior to COVID already. So we do know, have some level of safety data, although not at the same level as what we have today. The other thing to note is that uh, in drug development, there are a few things that you want to look out for. One, uh, one important one is actually mechanisms of action. So if you understand how the mRNA uh, vaccine works, right, in terms of its mechanism, then is there uh, what you call concern around whether it integrates, whether it can cause any kind of uh, DNA uh, mutations and so forth, which I think is what uh, has driven a lot of the concern around this. The answer is that we've not really seen it. It doesn't happen, right? So for that mechanistic basis, we don't think that would there be an unknown effect that, you, that uh, you know, never say never, but I would say that it, would there be an unknown effect that emerges 10 years later after this? I think it's highly, highly unlikely from what we see. Okay, it's a little bit different from the other uh, thing which sometimes get conflated with this is that will this result, rather than say, uh, is there a, a long-term effect that we will not see in the future? Is that whether or not there may be an effect that will last long-term from this? And that, maybe the answer to that is possibly yes. It really depends. So if you, if you ended up uh, as, as the rare cases that have occurred of, with myocarditis, and then some of this small number of people with the myocarditis have in fact had to uh, uh, put in a pacemaker and so forth, right? So those events, uh, rare uh, though they are, do, do occur, and uh, certainly we want to acknowledge concerns around it. And those things may result in a long-term uh, effect, right? Mm. But it's from a short-term occurrence, mm. so to speak. Mm. Over. Well, we're coming almost to the end of mm. this uh, Q&A uh, section, but uh, just maybe one question to sure. Dr. Lo. Uh, that's, that's posed by the audience. Uh, uh, should not T-cell immunity be tested for lasting immunity versus antibodies, uh, which, is in, which inevitably they will decline over time? So T-cell uh, yes, testing. I, I, I wish that it was possible, but I would just like to tell you how difficult it is to do T-cell testing. Um, I think there is a T-cell test kit, which maybe some of you are familiar with. It's called the TBT spot. So uh, if you heard of the T-spot test, that's T-cell immunity. And we know TB, we test for T-cell because T-cell kills TB. So uh, however, uh, each lab can run maybe 96 samples per day. And each test takes two days to run. So I tell you how it is. If you want to send a test to, to this lab, I wouldn't name names, but I can't send it on Friday because they don't work on Saturday. So the last cutoff time is Thursday. So it is so laborious and so few tests run it. It really cannot be used at any high level. So it can only be used at individual specific cases. Mm. So I, I hope the answer, and, and, and for endemic infection, it is really difficult. Probably cost is also a issue. Oh, oh, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, we <laughs> don't even have to go there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, just one, one question for myself. Yes, yes. Just you know, because uh, Dr. Danny is my classmate and he's uh, very distinguished in drug development. And things like that. I just want to ask him whether he can probe into the future. You know, is there any ongoing new development of vaccine? Because we are worried that this mRNA vaccine that we have from the various few companies, maybe their effect may be waning off in the, in the, in the commercial arena. Is there research and development into new vaccines for, for this COVID-19, which doesn't seem to be ending? Right. So I think, you know, if you talk about the, the two measures of uh, protection, right, you talk about antibody, neutralizing antibodies, or talk about T-cell uh, protection, I think the thinking certainly is that uh, in, as in normal physiology is that uh, after your initial doses of vaccines, even on boosters and so forth, is that your antibodies will wane over time. That's inevitable. You know, it's, 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 uh, it is part and parcel. However, whether or not then your, your, your T cell immunity will protect you against the more severe illnesses and whether hospitalization, that data is, you know, beginning to build nicely. Uh, we will have a better sense of it. Uh, and I think the, 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 the presence of antibody really is uh, a twofold, protect the individual against um, uh, infection. But number two also is also partially to put up a wall against transmission. So that's one aspect of why this vaccine, this uh, boosters and so forth, I think are important. Um, the question about further 
development of vaccines, certainly I think uh, if you have uh, vaccines that can uh, perhaps uh, uh, promote more mucosal immunity, that will then allow uh, a patient not to become infected too easily or transmit it. Uh, those are things that have been out there uh, looking at it. Uh, there are some challenges technically with how those can come forward, uh, but we shall see. You know, once we sort of pass this acute phase, I'm sure there will be other efforts to, to expand the, uh, the utility of such vaccines uh, in, into the future. Well, we eagerly await that uh, development to be surfaced into the commercial use. Um, well, we want to just want to thank the two speakers, the distinguished speakers, for uh, availing themselves in giving us such in fact, insightful knowledge uh, on this topic on COVID-19. So I shall end this uh, session in COVID-19, and I hope all of you enjoyed the session and uh, earn, uh, learned as much as I did, uh, even listening from our experts. 